Good evening. My name is Allison Kaplan. I'm Director of Education for the National First Ladies Library. We're located at the National First Ladies Historic Site here in Canton, Ohio. Before we get started this evening, I want to tell you about some upcoming programs and activities both here in Canton at the site and virtually via Zoom um, that you can take advantage of. Um, I want to encourage you to use the chat if you have questions. The Q&A is also available. If you want to share where you're tuning in from, um, what recipes you're most interested in, um, all of those things, we love to hear from you. Um, we do send out afterwards a link to uh, the program for you to watch after the fact, as well as the recipes. And if you look through the email you got prior that has the Zoom link, at the very bottom, there's a link to um, the site where you can download the PDF with the recipes. If you're having trouble uh, logging in or hearing via Zoom, we recommend if you're logged in through Eventbrite that you click out of Eventbrite into Zoom. Usually helps people open it up. Um, also, we are live on Facebook. So um, that's just another option and a way for you to tune in. So if you are here tonight um, for our cooking program and you are interested in first ladies or cooking or reading or crafting, other first lady friendly activities. We have uh, so much stuff coming up this year. Lots of really cool stuff. Um, if you travel to the National First Ladies Historic Site in Canton this summer, um, starting in May, we will have an exhibition of artifacts related to Jacqueline Kennedy. Um, part of that is donated to us by Monty Durham um, of Say Yes to the Dress Atlanta. And that includes a replica of Jackie Kennedy's wedding dress, which was designed by the very amazing celebrity in her own right, Anne Lowe. And for our first legacy lecture, um, well, second of the year, uh, on February 1st, we will be hosting Piper Hugley, who is the author of a fictional book about Anne Lowe by her own design. We're super excited about it. I just finished the book. I could not put it down. Really, really enjoyed it. So I'm super excited about that. I think it should be great. And then we're bringing our film discussion back. We are going to be watching that summer. It's a documentary Um inspired by Grey Gardens. Um, Grey Gardens is the famous documentary by the Maisels that um, looks into the lives of Jackie Kennedy's cousins. Um, and we will be joined for that by Jerry Torrey, who is the Marble Fawn, who is featured in the film Grey Gardens. And um, that summer, which will be accessible via Stark Library's Canopy, has all sorts of early footage that includes uh, Jackie and Lee. It's really interesting. And if you've joined us before for our Grey Gar Gardens discussions, um, they're really fun. So um, we might have to make that an annual activity. Um, we also have a talk with the curator coming up. We're going to be looking at Ma Mary Barber's hand-painted fan. Mary is the sister of Ida McKinley. Um, and if you've visited our site, uh, we also have the um, Mary Mary's home, uh, the the um, the Ida McKinley um, grew up in home. Um, so we're very excited to um, have that fan and have Michelle speak about it. We also have a book club coming up. Um, we are going to be reading a book about Alice Roosevelt. So if you love Scandals, you will love Alice Roosevelt. It uh, should be really fun. Um, and as always, keep looking at Eventbrite, uh, keep looking to our social media to find out what is going on with the National First Ladies Library. There's a lot to keep up with. And join our mailing list. We're um, always sending out updates via uh, Eventbrite, Facebook, and our mailing list. And hopefully uh, more opportunities connect uh, via a revamped website and uh, other spaces soon. So we're very excited about that. 
And without further ado, I want to turn things over to Sarah. Um, I'll be in the chat if you have questions for Sarah, um, if you have questions about the recipes, um, if you have great stories about cheese balls or Harvey Wallbangers, I'll be here to hear them. Um, so I'm going to mute myself and turn off my video and turn things over to Sarah. Oh, and by the way, Sarah Morgan is the um, host of the Instagram Cooking with the First Ladies, and we've had a great opportunity to connect with her um, to create content for our organization. And she also speaks um, for, I think, History Camp and a number of other really cool um, organizations about the First Ladies and recipes. Plus, she does PowerPoint better than anybody I know, including Al Gore. So I'm going to turn things over to Sarah, and I will be in the chat. Thanks so much. Awesome. Well, hey, y'all again. I'm Sarah Morgan, and welcome to Cooking with the First Ladies Live for the National First Ladies Library. Um, and this evening, we're going to be, of course, talking about Pat Nixon, who was a unique first lady um, who promoted volunteerism, the Equal Rights Act, and women's rights just around the globe. Um, as well, we're also going to talk about some of the scandals during the 1970s. Um, now, Pat was one of the most ambitious, driven, and consistently hardworking of all the first ladies and was also humorous as well as adventurous. Now, for my research, uh, I have used the National First Ladies Library, of course, and also the book First Women by Kate Brower, which I really recommend if you're into the First Ladies. Um, but tonight, uh, we're gonna make Pat's famous meatloaf, uh, an avocado salad, a sesame cheese ball, which are all personal recipes of hers, as well as a Watergate salad. Uh, but first, we're gonna start with a cocktail. Um, so we are going to make a Harvey wall banger this evening. Um, orange juice was actually one of the most popular mixers in the 1970s. Um, and the 70s kind of created the first cocktail that was geared towards women. Um, now, Galliano uh, went on to become the highest selling liqueur in America in the 1970s due to the popularity of this particular drink. Um, though back in the 60s, the company that imports this particular liqueur hired a man to create a cartoon of Harvey Wallbanger, a vibrant surfer, in order to sort of sell the drink, um, which is right here. Um, so to make this, we're going to start with our glass with a little bit of ice. We are going to put in one and a half ounces of vodka, four ounces of orange juice, and half an ounce of the Galliano. And then we are going to garnish that with an orange slice and a cherry. Oops. And there you have it, a Harvey Wall banger. Uh, so you can make that and you know make this cocktail and do a little dance, make a little love, get down tonight. Um, so just let me move this out of the way. And we are also going to make um, a non-alcoholic beverage, um, which is Pat Nixon's uh, White House Punch. Um, so uh, to make this, you are going to take, and I totally have the recipe, or, or actually forced it because um, I'm not serving a, you know, a giant party. Uh, so you're going to take um, your lemonade. I say that so when you get your recipe cards, you're not like, that didn't look like major ounces. Uh, then you're also going to take your orange juice. Using more orange juice and our pineapple juice. Grapefruit juice. And finally, you are going to top it off with chilled ginger ale. All right, and we are going to stir that up. And there you have it, the very simple Pat Nixon White House Punch. All right, so we are um, going to start just with a short presentation, um, a PowerPoint presentation, just with a little bit of uh, information about Pat Nixon, and then we'll cook the rest of our recipes. Uh, so I'm gonna pop over to my computer and get that started.
All right, so Pat Nixon was first lady during a decade marked by a time of scandals, rumors, and destroyed reputations, as well as gossip that ranged from those in politics to Hollywood notables, some of which are still causing a stir today. These salacious scandals of the 70s were not only events everyone could not stop talking about, but also in some ways define the decade. Basically alongside the disco ball, eccentric fads, soaring inflation, turbulent political, and interesting choices in fashion. Uh, now, many of these events alluded to the massive change culturally and socially that occurred during this tumultuous yet progressive decade. Uh, the music of the 70s wasn't all groovy tunes. The world was shaken when not only the Beatles broke up in 1970, shortly before their final studio album was released, but again, when John Lennon and Yoko Ono split for a time, uh, leading to his affair with his personal assistant. Uh, Jimi Hendrix's death was also controversial after he was pronounced dead in London in 1970. Although his death was ruled as asphyxiation, many believed his girlfriend, Monica Danneman, was involved and that either way, he was murdered. Another musician, Nancy Spurgeon, was supposedly stabbed by Sid Vicious of the Sex Pistols knife in 1979. However, this particular case was never solved, although John Ritchie, the real name of Vicious, died before he could stand trial after his arrest in relation to the murder. Cass Elliott passed away in the summer of 1974 of a heart attack, but controversially, many maintained she had choked on a ham sandwich. Ironically, four years later, the drummer for the band The Who, Keith Moon, died at the same address as Cass in Mayfair, London. Graham Parsons, the lead of the Flying Burrito Band, known for their country rock style cover of songs such as Wild Horses and Six Days on the Road, unintentionally became a topic of scandal after he died in 1973. His body was stolen by friends in order to fulfill his wishes of being cremated and his ashes spread at Joshua Tree, while his stepfather had insisted on a private burial in New Orleans. The police were alerted when smoke was spotted after the friends had drenched the coffin in gas and lit it on fire. In fact, the man who was responsible for some of these activities later lived in East Nashville and would hang out in various local, local bars telling the tale, but only if you bought him a beer. Now, Elvis Presley, of course, was yet another iconic musician who passed away in 1977. His body was almost stolen. The attempt was made by three men only nine days after Presley was buried, but they were released from custody as fast as they were arrested. Of course, the body has been formally interred at Graceland. In fact, in regards to Pat Nixon, Elvis visited the White House during the Nixon administration. However, his visit almost didn't happen because Richard Nixon was not a fan, but he ultimately was invited after their daughters, who were convinced him to let him come. Now, romances also created headlines and gossip, including the divorce of Sonny and Cher after she discovered he owned a significant portion of her enterprise and then claimed the marriage was involuntary servitude. Tammy Wynette, known as the first lady of country music and the legendary George Jones, tumultuous and tragic love story dominated headlines. Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton's on and off again romance surprised everyone when they originally divorced in 1974, remarried the following year, and finally divorced for good in 1976. In Hollywood, Roman Polanski fled the United States in 1978 after being charged with allegations uh, of various activities with a minor the year before. Now, Roman Polanski is also tied to another tragedy and a, a kind of another scandal, not of his own doing. As for over 200 days in 1970, the Manson family stood trial for the Tate LaBianca murders and other brutal crimes, which included his wife, Sharon Tate. Bob Crane, the lead actor of Hogan's Heroes, was killed by bludgeoning in 1978. His murder has never been solved, but most likely was at the hands of John Carpenter, who Crane had become involved in taping unsavory exploits with after his career declined. Jane Fonda turned into an activist rather than just an actress in July 1972 when she traveled to Vietnam during the height of the war, causing anger back in America. Uh, Hanwha Jane, the nickname given to her by the press, was attempting to prove American soldiers were bombing farmland and intentionally killing civilians. A photo of her pictured on a Vietnamese aircraft battery sparked even more outrage. In February of 1974, Patty Hearst was kidnapped by strangers who were later identified as members of a small group of political activists known as the Symbionese Liberation Army. 
They held her captive as they demanded the family donate millions to feed the needy, uh, which her wealthy publishing magnate grandfather instantly provided. Even so, the group's next goal was to rob a bank and Patty was caught on the security footage holding a gun and seemingly participating in the heist. She was ultimately arrested and found guilty, but only served two years when President Jimmy Carter commuted the verdict in 1979 and she was released on parole. The real scandal revolves around whether or not she was compliant in the entire situation or just brainwashed by her captors, as she claims. Charlie Chaplin, known as the Little Tramp, died on Christmas Day, 1977, and was mourned by the world. However, on March 1st, 1978, his body was stolen from a Swiss cemetery, adding a scandalous twist to his death. After a five-week investigation, police arrested two suspects who led them to Ch Chaplin's body in a cornfield, and they stated that the heist was for financial gain by asking for ransom money from his family. Now, in the sports world, Sonny Liston, a world heavyweight boxing champion, died under suspicious circumstances. Although the death was attributed to a heroin overdose, his involvement with high-profile drug dealers uh, he had become associated with after he fell into debt led many to believe he had fell victim to a more sinister demise. Baseball fans were also shocked when Willie Mays was banned from playing after he accepted a contract at a casino in Atlantic City. And most tragically, 11 Israeli athletes were killed in Munich at the Olympic Games in 1972 by Palestinian extremists. Another tragedy struck during the Kent State University shooting, which resulted in four students killed after the National Guard fired into the crowd. Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young wrote a song titled Ohio, which included the line, 10 soldiers and Nixon's coming, as well as the line, four dead in Ohio. The song resulted in controversy for many reasons. Of course, the biggest scandal of the decade directly affected Pat Nixon after the Watergate scandal broke. In 1972, the Democratic National Headquarters located in the Watergate building in Washington, DC, was broken into by Nixon's campaign aides and led to President Nixon becoming the first president in US history to resign from office. Deep Throat uh, became the insider whistleblower's nickname in the case who contacted the Washington Post reporters, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein and alerted them of the situation. The code name itself, however, was based on an entirely other scandal as the first successful mainstream adult movie starring Linda Lovelace entitled Deep Throat was the inspiration. The choice supposedly reflected the deepness of the information and to the film itself, strangely enough. Ultimately, the film was banned in many states due to the content. The producers received slight jail sentences, and the main actress claims that she was basically assaulted during the production and, of course, led to that first resignation of American president. The decade also saw some major advancements in space exploration, including the launch of Skylab in 1973, and the lunar rover was used for the first time when Apollo 15 landed on the moon. Tragedy struck a few years earlier, though, when Apollo 13 radioed Houston, we have a problem. Technology also progressed as internet chat rooms appeared and the microprocessor, the foundation for modern computers, was developed in 1971. Now, scandals or not, the 70s were an uncertain time either way, with the high gas prices, distrust in the government, rising inflation, and various energy crises. However, the decade significant and extends further as Americans began moving from traditional values to an openness in regards to cultural issues involving equality and personal freedoms, as well as improved relationships with communist countries and the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, now, Thelma Catherine Ryan was born on St. Patrick's Day uh, in 1912, just before midnight, though in Eli, Nevada. So her father nicknamed her his quote, St. Patrick's Day babe in the morn and also became known as Patricia or Pat for short in honor of her father's Irish heritage. Years later, she legally changed her name to Patricia and going forward, she was always known as Pat. Prior to marrying Pat's father, her mother had been married and had two children, but her husband had died in a flash flood in South Dakota in 1926. Pat had a total of four siblings, two, of which were half from her mother's first marriage, as well as two brothers. At a young age, they relocated to Artesia, California and lived on a farm growing produce, which she harvested and helped sell. 
This land is now Patnickson Park, which in addition to several acres of land, also is the site of the home she grew up in uh, that has since burned down and is located in Cerritos, the neighboring town. Now, not much later in life, when her mother was diagnosed with liver cancer and passed away in 1925, she took over the household chores, cooking, and helped take care of her siblings, all while still helping on the farm at the young age of 13. Later, when her father was dying of tuberculosis and succumbed to the illness in 1930, she continued her duties, but was also able to graduate from Excelsior High School. She then worked part-time at a bank while achieving one of her goals of getting a college education when she attended Fullerton College, uh, Fullerton Junior College um, at the time. Now, Pat's most interesting job, however, was in 1932 when she drove an elderly couple across the country with a bus ticket back as her compensation. But before she headed home, she spent some time with her family in New York and learned the art of medical care, uh, which included a summer course at Columbia University, University in radiology. Now, many years later, uh, as first lady, Pat told Gloria Steinem in an interview that she really never had time to think about, quote, who I wanted to be or who I admired or to have ideas, uh, basically because she had to work so much and didn't have time to dream about those types of things. Uh, Pat was also extremely successful in school and in fact, skipped the second grade. She eventually attended the University of Southern California in 1934, where she worked as a psychology teacher's assistant, researching for his book and grading papers. When she needed more funds for school and her family, she worked in various positions, such as in the library, waitressing in the cafeteria, as well as odd jobs, which included testing beauty products, working as a buyer in a department store, and even being a movie extra who was paid $25 for the part in the movie Becky Sharp. Now, oftentimes she worked 40 hours a week in addition to her schooling, but she eventually graduated cum laude, making her the first first lady to earn a graduate degree. She met Richard Nixon, a recent law degree graduate of Duke University while working as a teacher at Whittier High School in 1937 in the Quaker community in La Puente Hills. Pat was not only an educator whose students described as inspirational, but was also very involved in student organizations and participated in various activities and clubs. Their first meeting was actually at an audition for parts in a play, The Dark Tower, and the two were given the lead in the community theater production. Their connection was so strong, Richard supposedly drove her on other dates, picked her up and took her home, which led to their engagement about a year after their meeting. They married in a Quaker ceremony at the Old Mission Inn in Riverside, California, in what is known as the Presidential Lounge in June of 1940. After they married, Pat served as a clerk in World War II, working for the Office of Price Administration, making a salary of $2,000 a year, while Richard served in the Navy. The couple also lived in Iowa during, during his first active duty assignment, uh, and she moved back to California during his stint in the South Pacific, and then they later moved to Maryland. The couple had two children, Patricia, who they called Trisha, and Julie, who would later marry David, the grandson of former president Dwight Eisenhower. Trisha, born shortly after the family's entrance into political life in 1946, was the first of eight presidential daughters to be married in a rose garden ceremony. Their second daughter, Julie, born in 1948, the year after her father began serving his second term in the House of Representatives, also later became a published author, writing her cookbook for children, as well as a book about her mother. The couple's first campaign in 1946 was, they were known as the Pat and Dick team, which led to an elected position in con Congress, the first from Whittier, California, and to become the vice presidential running mate for Dwight D. Eisenhower. During the inaug inauguration, Pat held the Nixon family Bibles as he took the oath of office in 1953. Pat Nixon literally went on to make the role of second lady as the wife of the vice president, a more public figure. She would actually oftentimes step in for current first lady, Mamie Eisenhower. During this time, she also traveled to 53 countries due to the fact the Eisenhowers were sending the couple together on these trips because they acted as such amazing goodwill ambassadors. One stop included Venezuela. However, upon arrival at the airport, they were met with a violent mob who were throwing stones at them. Their car was attacked by protesters who for over 10 minutes beat their car with bats and tried to overturn the vehicle. Now, during these overseas travels though, Pat visited hospitals, schools, and housing projects 
as well as attended dinners with dignitaries at night. Back in America, she also visited similar establishments in underprivileged areas rather than always attending formal events. Nevertheless, the media portrayed her as plastic pat because she had a permanent smile during the entire famous checkers speech given by then Pre Vice President Nixon. She was also seen as always poised and in fact cried only two times in public, once when Richard lost to JFK in 1960 and the second when he gave his final presidential speech as they exited the White House. Some of this stoic, seemingly unemotional attitude was also due to her fatigue from 20 years of support from her husband during seven political campaigns. When Nixon ran for president against JFK in 1960, Pat played a huge role in the campaign and even traveled to all 50 states and was prepared to step into the role of first lady. However, after the loss, the smallest popular vote margin in US history, she was exhausted of the life of a political wife. In between these campaigns, Nixon lived in an apartment in Central Park where Pat took full advantage of the culture in the city. Although not thrilled about his run for the presidency in 1968, she accompanied him on the campaign trail. But this time the American public created a campaign for her specifically of their own with the slogan, Pat for First Lady on everything from buttons to bumper stickers, specifically targeted at Republican housewives of the previous decade. Richard once recall, recalled, quote, I remember through all our campaigns, whether it was a receiving line or whether it was going to a fence at the airport, she was the one that always insisted on shaking that last hand, not simply because she was thinking of that vote, but because she simply could not turn down that last child or that last person. She also became the first Republican first lady to address the national convention that was nominating her husband for the presidency and her efforts in that 1972 campaign set a precedent for future spouses of those who were campaigning. When he was elected in 1973, it was the largest mandate in US history, which included a win of 49 out of 50 states and 61% of the popular vote. Pat became the first incumbent first lady uh, to endorse the, excuse me, after the win over incumbent President Johnson, Pat Nixon became first lady on January 20th, 1969. Pat kept with the traditions of presidential inaugurations. However, during the second, she didn't wear a hat, which was a 108 year old custom, making her the first of the first ladies to do so in over a hundred years. Uh, Pat became the first incumbent first lady to endorse the ERA and to support the Roe versus Wade decision. She also publicly called for her husband to appoint a woman to the Supreme Court, but when he didn't, she received tons of letters in her support. However, he did issue a proclamation making the anniversary of women's suffrage as Women's Equality Day after the women's strike in August of 1970, which was held on the 50th anniversary of women gaining the right to vote. She was also the first First Lady to wear pants like out in public and modeled them for a national magazine. Pat also worked to encourage volunteer programs throughout the United States and urged citizens to participate in community service projects, as well as advocated for the passage of the Domestic Services Volunteer Act of 1970. She once said, quote, the spirit of people helping people. She also continued volunteering uh, for the Red Cross, an organization she had started working with in the 1940s. Pat also initiated the program Legacy of the Parks, which turned federally protected land into areas available for public recreation, especially in larger cities for people who couldn't travel to faraway national parks. In addition, she hosted Evenings in the Park in Washington, DC, which was a series of local con concerts for underprivileged children in the area, and also sponsored the Right to Read program alongside the Welfare Department. She also took her role as first lady seriously in that she would spend hours every day reading the letters she received and personally signed each response. Some of the letters included requests for medical assistance and she would do her best to help, including sending several children to hospitals and even once contacted the American Heart Association to alert them to a child who needed surgery. Until Clinton, she was the most traveled first lady going to 41 states and 31 countries traveling over 100,000 miles, where she also wore traditional garments and absorbed the culture of the places she was visiting. Due to her extensive travels, she was given the title personal representative of the president. In fact, she actually, during her time as first lady, traveled more miles than Eleanor Roosevelt. 
One of her excursions was to South Vietnam, where she visited an orphanage and an army hospital, but became the first first lady since Eleanor Roosevelt to visit a combat zone. She flew over an active fighting zone in an open air military helicopter. She then later delivered notes to soldiers' families, letting them know they were in, quote, good spirits. Uh, she also participated in humanitarian efforts, especially in Peru, after the country suffered a devastating earthquake, which led her to be granted the highest decoration in the country, the Grand Cross of the Order of the Sun, making her the first American woman to receive the honor. They also visited the Middle East, where they visited Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and Saudi Arabia. It also included a trip to Israel, where Pat visited Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center, and was pictured observing the Hall of Remembrance. She also went on a trip to Africa, an ex excursion which extended thousands of miles, 10,000 to be exact, supposedly, along the Ivory Coast, where she notably became the first First Lady to represent the American president, but also received the honorary title of Madame Ambassador in 1972. Uh, the Nixons made history when they visited the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China in 1972, which, quote, cooled down the Cold War and also scaled down the arms race after Premier Brezhnev collectively signed the agreement limiting nuclear arsenals for the nations, or SALT. This trip uh, reflected the growing change in Chinese society and the increasingly open relationship with the United States, and it also changed American foreign policy forever. The Nixons were the first presidential couple to visit Mao Zedong's nation since he refused Eleanor Roosevelt's visit in 1949, when he took China from ancient dynastic ruling to one of communism. Pat also became the first incumbent first lady to make the trip, as well as the first to visit a communist nation during her lifetime. In preparation for the trip, she studied dossiers, learned basic Chinese phrases, and also familiarized herself with the Little Red Book, which was a required reading for all Chinese citizens meant to instill communist principles. When Pat arrived in Peking, China on February 21st that year, she wore an iconic red coat with the color ironically symbolizing good luck. Uh, among many experiences during her time in China, she also tasted goldfish, which they considered a delicacy. Uh, the historic trip also resulted in the Washington National Zoo receiving two giant pandas, which further symbolized the positive relations between the two nations. The pandas also allowed the National Zoo to become a leader in panda education and conservation and continues to be a treasured attraction at the facility. Uh, directly following their visit to the Soviet Union, the Nixons traveled to Tehran, where they met with Iranians waving Iranian and American flags and was yet another strategic move in regards to the Cold War. These trips would ultimately lead Pat to become one of the most admired women of the Cold War. She also focused her efforts on restoring the White House and alongside her curator acquired 600 paintings, antiques, furniture, and more. Lady Bird Johnson uh, presided over the White House Committee for the preservation of the White House and decided to replace a mantle in the Lincoln bedroom, which was the one Jackie Kennedy had inscribed memorializing their time in the White House. However, it wasn't until Pat Nixon was first lady that it was actually removed. And therefore, she was the one who drew the criticism from the press, stating she, quote, removed Jackie's handiwork. Either way, Lady Bird and Pat were friendly, and Pat sent her yellow roses after the loss of the election, even when the Johnsons felt uh, the spirit of the Democratic youthfulness was lost with the Republican Nixons. Uh, Jackie and Pat were also on good terms, especially after her top secret visit to the White House in 1971. The Nixons welcomed Jackie and her children for the unveiling of the Kennedy's portrait, which was amazingly kept completely private and away from the press. Pat also made the White House more accessible to the public by adding handicap ramps, inclusive pamphlets for the hearing impaired, blind, and offered them in different languages. She added history along the fence line so people could still learn if they didn't have time to wait and sometimes long lines to gain entrance and also had floodlights installed that lit the White House and other major monuments throughout the city at night. Pat also offered evening as well as garden and grounds tours of the home, which also began the tradition of candlelight Christmas tours. Pat was also passionate about gardening and adored roses. In 1973, and continuing with her goal of making the White House more available to the public, hosted the first White House garden tour. She also invited many families to attend non-denominational church services in the East Room. Pat also focused on encouraging American 
culture by instituting a variety of musical performances at the White House, ranging from opera to bluegrass. Uh, Pat also became the first incumbent first lady to throw a first pitch for a major league baseball team in 1971. Uh, Pat was always a supporter of her husband during the Watergate scandal, which she and the family were kept in the dark until they learned about it from the media. During uh, the impeachment, however, she opposed his destruction of the secretly recorded tapes. When his staff refused, she was deeply upset by his inner circle's decision regarding the matter, but ultimately always supported her husband despite the allegations. Pat was always a model political wife and once said her only goal was to, quote, go down in history as the wife of a president. Pat also adamantly insisted on the resignation to not be televised, although it ultimately was with the president ultimately saying he resigned in the interest of the nation. Either way, Nixon was the only person to be elected twice for the vice presidency and twice for the presidency. She stood by him even as he became that first president in history to resign, including the shameful day they exited the White House for the last time on August 9th, 1974. Incoming First Lady Betty Ford, as well, as well as Gerald, accompanied the Nixons to the helicopter waiting for them on the South Lawn. Betty and Pat had grown close, and Betty felt extremely sorry for Pat and the situation. As Maureen One departed, Pat quietly said, quote, it's so sad, it's so sad, and it was mostly silent otherwise. In fact, the only other day that was even sadder was the day President Ford pardoned Richard because it was an admittance of defeat. Uh, during this time, Pat's prior communications director came to stay with them and over dinner one evening began talking about previous presidents she had worked for and to lighten the mood, stopping mid-story, basically asked if he was recording the conversation. Uh, Pat started laughing and she was assured by Richard that he in fact was not. Uh, after their departure from the White House, they returned to their home in California. La Casa Pacifica, Pat became very private and would read up to five books a week, as well as focused on one of her favorite pastimes, gardening. During her post flotus life, she also took care of her husband through illnesses and depression until she suffered a stroke, which she ultimately mostly recovered from in 1976. Throughout these same years and into the 1980s, Pat kind of avoided the public eye, uh, but did uh, attend a few events, um, including the dedication of a school name for her in 1975. Uh, she also uh, attended the opening event for the Richard Nixon Presidential Library, which included a rose garden filled with black and red roses developed for her during her time as First Lady back in 1972. In 1980, the Nixons eventually moved back to the East Coast to be closer to their children and grandchildren. In 1990, Pat was listed as number six on Good Housekeeping's Most Admired Women list, which she had been in the top 10 for the past 20 years. The same year she plan planned the Pat Nixon Rose Garden at the Nixon Presidential Li Library in Yorba Linda, California, which also features a tree that she grew from a seedling from an original White House Jackson Magnolia, excuse me. Around this time, Pat's health was failing and she had dealt with oral cancer, emphysema, and was ultimately diagnosed with lung cancer. Uh, as even though she was never seen in public with a cigarette, was a lifelong smoker. She passed away just 10 months prior to Richard on June 22nd, 1993, at her home in Park Ridge, New Jersey. The epitaph on her grave says, quote, even when people can't speak your language, they can tell if you have love in your heart. Pat and Richard are buried alongside one another in Yorba Belinda, California, at the Nixon Presidential Library in the gardens she planned. Uh, so it's about time to get cooking. Uh, in regards to the cooking, Pat supposedly began collecting recipes when she was only 13 years old. She shared some of her recipes over time as a political wife, including issuing recipes for Thanksgiving and even distributed them on a door knocker flyer during the campaign in 1968. She preferred, quote, wholesome food simply prepared like rare roast beef and Irish stew. Uh, she claimed she was not gourmet. Uh, Richard uh, Nixon was personally a huge fan of cottage cheese, which he garnished sometimes with ketchup. In fact, his last meal before leaving the White House was a bowl of cottage cheese and pineapple. The Nixons actually hosted over 50,000 guests in their first year alone at the White House, setting an unprecedented record. They also set another record at the time with the largest dinner ever held at the White House when they hosted Vietnam War POWs returning home. Another major affair, was their daughter's wedding in the Rose Garden at the White House. Now, during the Nixon's years at the White House, popular foods included Jello and various molds. Hamburger Helper was new to the scene in 1971. 
Several inventions also made cooking easier, such as the crock pot in 1971 and the Cuisinart food processor in 1973, which was so popular during the holidays. A few years later, stores were selling empty boxes with the promise of a later delivery of the product. Okay, so let's get cooking. Okay, so first up tonight, we are going to make Pat Nixon's sesame cheese ball. Uh, so you are going to take your shredded cheese. Um, you are gonna have some onions that are soaked in a lemon juice um, and a beef flavor base. So I took like a beef bouillon cube and uh, just made just a little tiny bit of beef flavor base. So we're gonna add that in. All right, and then you're going to take ketchup, Worcestershire, uh, I can't ever say it, y'all know, dry mustard um, and mayonnaise um, and add that in to your mix. And then we're just gonna stir it up. Um, so uh, Pat Nixon had a little bit of a guilty pleasure um, which was tabloid magazines. And so uh, her social secretary, Lucy Winchester, would actually kind of sneak them uh, into her fist or whatnot in a folder. Um, and then Pat would kind of hand them back to her and actually say, burn before reading, uh, because she never ever wanted the press to find out about it. So that's pretty cool. And of course, cheese balls were, I guess, a popular dish in the 70s. So once you get that all mixed up, um, I also pre-toasted the sesame seeds. Um, so we're just gonna take a little bit of wax paper and sprinkle our sesame seeds and spread them on our wax paper pretty good. And then put our cheese. And roll her up and get it kind of those seeds all spread around on there. And some of y'all might have a better way to do this, but I am not a chef so but anyway um so you'll just kind of get this and get your cheese ball all made with your sesame seeds and then wrap it up and put it in the fridge all right so i'll just rinse my hands off really quick and uh we'll of course show you the finished product so what you'll get is Pat Nixon's cheese ball. Um, and you can serve it with uh, whatever type of crackers you want. I went with the Ritz. Um, so next is her avocado salad. Um, and uh, what we're gonna do here is uh, mash two uh, avocados and then we are going to stir that in with just a little bit, and I've already made my gelatin, lemon uh, gelatin mix. And that will be our base and just slightly thickened, but okay. And then uh, we are going to mix that in with our uh, one can of grapefruit that's been drained. Get this out of the way. All right. And three tablespoons of lemon juice. And our celery. And to be honest, when I show you the finished product, I thought this looks no good. But actually, um, I tasted a little bit of it earlier and it wasn't terrible, but I don't think it's like the prettiest dish ever but um but the pandas uh that were of course gifted to the united states 
Um, did y'all actually know that those started over a conversation about Chinese cigarettes? Uh, Pat uh, had just kind of visited the zoo and uh, looked down and, and saw his pack of cigarettes, which were Chinese, like a Chinese brand of cigarettes, like panda cigarettes, and they had pandas on them. And she kind of remarked about how cute they were. And um, he said, well, I'll give you some. And she looked really confused and was like, cigarettes? And he said, no, pandas. So I thought that was pretty interesting because I actually did not know that before reading about Pat. All right. So once you get that all stirred up, then you can use your jello mold. And mine that I'm going to show you as a finished product did not come out of the mold. Super pretty, um, but it worked out either way. So then what you're going to do is also, this is another dish you're gonna have to chill. But your finished product, which mine doesn't look very pretty, but um, looks like it's gonna taste good anyway, um, Pat Nixon's avocado salad. Okay, and next we are going to make the Watergate salad. Now, um, the recipe was actually known as pistachio pineapple delight, but was renamed Watergate salad by a food editor in 1975 who thought it would kind of pique readers' interest after the presidential scandal. Uh, pineapple was also extremely popular in the 70s due to increased interest in Hawaiian culture. Um, so you're going to take crushed pineapple um, in the juice, not drained, um, as well as uh, one package of pistachio instant pudding mix, which I thought might for some reason be hard to find, but it wasn't. Uh, they just had it at the local store. So, um, and then you're going to take a half a cup chopped walnuts and one cup mini marshmallows. And we're going to stir that up first. I lost the marshmallows. I don't think I chose a deep enough dish. All right, so we're gonna mix it up. And I just, I really love that it's that like classic green color. All right, and then we're just going to add in our thawed um, frozen whipped cream. Stir that up. And once you chill, this one this is another one that you have to chill. Um, then once you chill this, then we will have um, a lovely uh, Watergate salad, which we are going to top with whipped cream and cherries. There we go, Watergate salad. Could not not make Watergate salad uh, with Pat Nixon. Okay, and our last recipe is my absolute favorite recipe. It's one of my favorite recipes I've ever cooked for a first lady, um, and that is Pat Nixon's meatloaf. And um, I'm not really sure so much what is so different about it, uh, but it was kind of just different than any meatloaf that I'd ever made. Um, so we're going to start, um, dice your bread, and then you're going to soak that in a half a cup of milk. And so we're going to let that start doing that for just a second. And then uh, we've got our ground beef. And then you are going to, which I just already did this part um, just because of the time, uh, but you are going to go ahead and saute the onion and the garlic. And then you're gonna let it cool anyway. So now we're gonna add that to our beef. And then we will um, add in our salt and pepper, chopped parsley, chopped thyme, 
and the egg. And then you can add in your bread. And then um, her particular recipe actually says that you have to do it with your hands. Um, and it is the messiest part, of course, but it does get it mixed together really well. So we're gonna mix this up. Um, now, uh, this uh, Pat's meatloaf recipe was a favorite of her husband's. Um, and in addition to his love of cottage cheese, uh, was actually, um, you know, printed up for White House stationery and mailed out uh, on request. So although not like a totally traditional meatloaf, um, it is, a, it's delicious. And like I said, my go-to recipe. Um, so you can serve it, you know, a long time uh, alongside mashed potatoes and peas for, you know, classic American dinner. Um, in fact, though, this recipe even has another story. Now, shortly after leaving the White House, uh, Pat Nixon phoned an old friend, uh, again, her social secretary, Lucy Winchester, because Richard wanted her to cook this particular meatloaf. Um, and in fact, she couldn't find it because the FBI actually still had it confiscated and was hoping that Lucy could help her remember how to make it. Um, so the, the FBI even took Pat Nixon's recipes. And in fact, they took uh, one of her, of, of the Nixon daughter's wedding dresses as well. So we're gonna take this, we're gonna put it over here. I'm gonna move those out of the way first. And instead of cooking it in a pan, we're gonna shape it into a meatloaf shape just here on the pan. Um, kind of helps the grease uh, come off better. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take our tomato paste and spread that on top. Normally, I'd wash my hands in between every single step of this, but um, in the interest of y'all not watching me wash my hands. <laughs> Um, so anyway, shape that into your meatloaf shape, spread the top with your tomato paste, and then sprinkle your top with breadcrumbs. And then we are going to add it into a 375 degree oven. And you'll cook it for about an hour. All right, so we're gonna put that in the oven. For one hour, but we won't have to wait because you'll get a lovely Pat Nixon meatloaf. And you can also serve that, of course, like I said, alongside your uh, mashed potatoes and green peas. So. Uh, Pat Nixon was just a fantastic first lady, um, and there, uh, you know, a newspaper article had said that she could just make friends anywhere that she went, all across the United States. Um, and although she was kind of mysterious, um, she really just used her public voice uh, to actually express it and use it for things that were really, really important to her. Um, so she was just a delightful representative um, of the United States and just obviously a wonderful first lady. So thanks all so much for joining. And uh, you can follow me again on at Cooking with the First Ladies on Instagram. Um, and of course, follow the National First Ladies Library on their socials as well. Um, and again, just thanks so much. And I'll be here if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Sarah. The PowerPoint was wonderful. We had so much fun um, following along with all of the recipes, uh, lots of comments on the Watergate salad and uh, experiencing that uh, via grandmas and uh, avocados and lots of colors. Uh, we had a few questions here. 
Um, again, I want to remind people that we will send a link out to all of the participants with a link to the program as well as link to the recipes. And um, we put it in the chat and we'll keep putting it in the chat as we finish up tonight. Um, someone had a question about um, state dinners and what control Pat had in deciding the menu for those. Um, I think that she kind of had an opinion. I honestly don't know. I didn't really look in so much about the state dinners. Um, but I, I, she was just, she was kind of more simple on her food. She wasn't one of the more, um, like hands-on first ladies. I don't feel like, um, in the kitchen necessarily, like some of them were. Um, so I'm not really 100% sure. I'm sorry. I did know that the, the punch was served at almost all of her like Christmas events and activities that she would have. The punch was kind of like the signature thing that you you had available. So that was really cool to, to see because I didn't know what went into that. Um, another question in here uh, was, let's see, we, I'm just curious. We, where did she bring the recipes that that we learned about tonight with her to the White House? Were they just staples of her family? Um, and she cooked them before and after. Some of them were staples. The meatloaf for sure was a staple. Um, mm -hmm. Just in researching uh, now, the Watergate salad, of course not. That's just a connect connection. The Harvey Wallbanger, just a connection to the seventies. Um, but both the cheese ball and the avocado salad were both attributed to her in various different um, books and websites and things that talk about Pat Nixon over and over. There was also a newspaper article that featured some of her recipes, um, which some of that kind of stuff was featured in. And um, so I, I'm not sure that she took them all to the to the White House, but for whatever reason, the FBI confiscated the meatloaf, which I just thought was crazy. They probably just really liked it. <laughs> those donut knockers were really cool. I've seen those. Yeah. So she definitely disseminated recipes as part of her campaigning for her husband, which was really interesting. And uh, we've only seen more recently with cookies and not uh, meatloaf and other more complicated dishes. So that was cool. Um, can you tell us what the next first lady we're going to be doing is? Oh my gosh, y'all, I knew I was going to get asked that question tonight and I just did not look. I totally forgot. Like, like I'm just, it's a whirlwind, I'm, you know, but um, I don't know, Allison, do you have a written I know down? it. I know it. Um, okay. On uh, April 24th, it's Mamie Eisenhower, which I think is such a great fit. So we'll- it is. Keeping the jello molds and uh housewives. Uh but knowing that there's more Pink. to that. We'll have yeah. a lot of, you know, I'll have to bust my Pink Pyrex out again. Um, some Mamie Pink. No, it's so terrible. I knew, I knew I needed to read that. Got it. You, so <laughs> The, the recipes and the cooking and the um, PowerPoint is a lot. And thank you so much because you really brought to life um, so much of the contributions that Pat Nixon made, that she was so well-traveled, that she contributed so much, that she started her life out working so hard. Um, she's such an interesting figure in history and I love getting to learn more about her. So thank you Enough. so much. Really quick, that was one thing that I did. I didn't really include because it was just getting like what too long. But I did read um, that when she was in China, she would have kind of these like interactions and conversations with people who kind of saw her as this like very you know prestigious person um, who just must have always been that way. But because she came from such humble backgrounds, she was like visiting and like you know petting the pigs and you know kind of saying like you know I grew up on a farm and, th and it's kind of you know was really relatable in that way because um you know she didn't she did not grow up wealthy or you know dignity you know all that sort of thing so I just thought that was pretty cool about her too 
Well, thank you so much, Sarah. This has been really fun. I'm really excited to make some cheese balls and uh, Watergate salad and kick back with a Harvey Wallbanger this weekend. So I'm looking forward to that. I want to thank everyone. Um, the conversation and our chat is always so great for these programs. It's so fun to hear about your experiences of the 70s, your um, most remembered scandals and your experiences eating green jello or uh, meatloaf. Uh, it's really been great. So thank you so much, Sarah. And again, we will email out the recipes to people and um, send you a program link and we'll put up uh, maybe I and Howard link for people to register for next time. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. Have a great night.